Hi everybody, Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite. With me today I've got John. Uh, John is dialing in all the way from Australia, um, which is uh, by the, the powers of, of, of magic and the internet. Um, uh, and we're going to talk about big deals, aren't we, John, and, and, and managing them and, and how to sell them. Before we go any further, where can people get hold of you? Uh, John Smybert, S-M-I-B-E-R-T. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, anybody wants to connect, please don't even hesitate uh, and I'll respond. Uh, you can also get me on uh, Twitter, uh, John Smybert, uh, and um, yeah, just about anywhere else by searching those names. Website is salesleaderforums.com. There's only one John Smybert. Well, there's more than one John Smybert around the world, but it's certainly only one in the in the field I'm in. Mm. And you are always very active on on social, so yeah, and people should connect with you because you share loads of great stuff. Pain in the butt, aren't I? Too much. Out there. <laughs> John, why don't you give a, a, a brief outline of your experience because it, it's it's relevant for for the discussion today. You know your sales career and your sales history because you've been a big deals guy anyway, haven't you? Now, 40 years in the IT industry, always working for, well, nearly always working for large um, vendors, starting with IBM in 1970 and going through a few years with IBM, many years in NCR, Unisys, Fujitsu, and that's just on 40 years, those four names. Wow, that's that's amazing. And and as I said, you've always worked on, so, so when, when we're talking about big deal, what do we, what, what kind of value do we, in, in, in US oh, dollars? In US dollars, um, anything up to 100 million. Uh, I think the largest I've ever worked on is about 100 million. Right. Uh, but yeah, through my career, obviously, I've worked on lots of smaller deals as well. Um, yeah, going through, uh, I, st I started in sales um, and spent probably eight or 10 years in sales and then moved into sales management and from then into more senior roles, general management and so on, but always with a sales quota. Um, you know, even in general management roles in the companies I was with, our focus was very much sales, and and I had a responsibility to achieve a sales number along with you know, P and L and so on. Hmm. And um, so um, you've actually you have a, um, a your own sales methodology around doing big deals, which is yeah. based around a, a word that you, that you know, a bit like. Bant or Scotsman or any of those sort of uh, acronyms. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I I left the corporate world yes, fifteen years ago now, mm. uh, and and started a consulting uh, company, small consulting uh, affair, and uh, as part of that, we develop a whole lot of IP um, to help companies. Uh, you know, embed a culture, a sales culture that was was productive in their organisation, and in doing so, yes, methodologies. And, and you mentioned methodologies around big, big deals, uh, or even smaller deals. A sales methodology take you from way to go, and and yeah, well, it, it, we'll probably spend most of the time talking about that. But also account management methodologies and a whole lot of other stuff which we won't go into now. Um, and and the methodology. Um, that I've more recently labelled the, the the deal methodology uh, is advance uh, E D V A N C E, um, and uh, we'll talk more about what that means. But the idea is, uh, I, I'm a great believer in the importance of process, both yeah. from a buyer's point of view and from the sales organisation's point of view. Uh, and advance is certainly a, a process uh, and a methodology we've developed and deployed in a number of organisations now that helps those organisations advance the sale, but it's also designed to align with the buyer journey, particularly if we're in early enough in the uh, opportunity in the, in the customer environment. And, and I think always with sales methodology, I'm a great believer that sales is a process. Um, and especially if you're doing um, uh, large deals, um, so um, the um, you need to know it, it, you need to know where you are in the process, both from a sales perspective and from a sales management perspective, and it also provides you with a common language. 
and, and the common language is vital because in this day and age, particularly in larger deals, but even in small deals, if you're doing it right and got the right sales culture in your organisation, it's a team activity. It's not a one-person activity. Yeah. It's not the salesperson out following a process driving a sale. So it needs to be a, a means by which the team communicates and communicates with the customer. Uh, and I'm a great believer in sharing your sales process with your customer. This is the process we normally go through, Mr. Customer. Yeah. What process do you follow? Let's make sure we align so that we're working to help each other. Yeah. Because at, at the end of the day, <clears throat> um, when people buy stuff, the, the whole point of it is you're going to make their lives, um, they make their business better. Um, and therefore, you know, if, if we, you know, we share, we run this process because it works best for our clients and works best for us. Yeah. Uh, and, and the reason we're here is, is to, to create value for our clients or help our clients realise the value they're looking for, achieve the outcomes they're looking for. Uh, and so our process has got to be very aligned to the client, but also help us internally drive that outcome for the client as well. Yeah, I worked on a deal um, uh, at my previous company where there was 86 salespeople on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, that's a big it, deal. That's it, a lot more than a hundred million dollars. Well, it, it wasn't actually. It wasn't actually. But it's because I worked for a company where the CEO believed that every single product needed to have a salesperson, and 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 the idea was to flood the client with um, with salespeople. So there was a hundred. There was sorry. There's eighty five salespeople on it. Yeah. Did that work? Uh, well, it, it, it was one. So, um, uh, but. But you can. But, the, but my, my point is, is that the coordination of that uh, was a job in itself. Yeah. Um, and Indeed, that, you know, in very large deals, you've, you've got a team of people. Uh, the, the sales people are, are just one part of that. Um, and uh, I, I believe most of the salespeople I know are not necessarily good project managers. So in a very large uh, deal, you need a bid managers and project yeah. managers involved and so on. Uh, and, of course, um, particularly in a, in a services-oriented business, you need to have the people that are ultimately going to deliver the service being mm. involved in, in the bid as well. Uh, the customer needs to meet them. They need to build trust in, in the team you've got and so on. Yeah. So they're all part of the team. Yeah. So let's let's work through your um, advance. So um, E. Engage. It's and why do I use the word? I, I used to be advance, and I, the A used to be for approach. Let's approach the customer. Mm. But in the, in, the, in this day and age, we we need to be building a relationship with the customer even before any of us talk verbally with a customer. And, and you know, you, you're very much into social uh, selling and social media and so on. So yeah, we need to be yeah. engaging at all sorts of levels. Marketing have a role in the sale. So you know, very early in the process and, and product release, product development people and so on all have a role to play in engaging with the customer in some form or another. So we need to think about the, the engagement strategy that ultimately leads to us talking face to face. Uh, at some stage in their buying journey and, some, and, very, and obviously the first stage of our, our selling process. So, that engage, so that's why we chose to engage. It wasn't just approach. It was yeah. how do you engage with the client and, and, and build, start building a trusted relationship before anybody ever talks to each other between us and the client. And I, and I, I really like, I, I prefer engaged in advance um, because, you know, it, it could be that we have, um, we're sharing insights uh, on social media, and and exactly. the client actually engages with that content. And at that point, you don't know where the client is in the buyer's journey, um, but the fact is that they've they've engaged, and that insights or that education has formed the conversation, rather than the but you know buy my stuff um, because it's great that we the the the, the people um, put forward most of the time. I have a friend who has built an entire business on Engage, and I know that a lot of your businesses are around this as well. Uh, and, and this uh, friend actually is focused on very large deals for, for very large clients. So he works with IBM and a whole lot of others. Uh, and, for example, if IBM uh, working with a bank, uh, they will outsource to him the job of building a relationship with a whole host of, host of targeted executives in that bank. And he has, God forbid the term, SDRs, 
But the SDRs are people that have been in sales 40 years, have been selling to senior executives. They're not the young guy you hire as 20 or 23 year old and say and say here's how to make a phone call uh so these these guys know how to build a relationship with the senior executive and then on top of that the data they have and the, and the content they have uh, is time to to feed and, and build trust and a relationship and value for all the executives in that organization that's the sort of thing i mean by engage and it doesn't you know you don't have to outsource it anybody can do it provided you think about the strategy and how you are going to engage and build that level of trust so the very first time a salesperson talks to the client there's already trust between the two organizations um and let, let's move on to the next one which is discover which is um uh, what well, discover and disrupt discover and disrupt yeah um, to me this is where the, all the selling occurs uh, so yeah the, the rest of the process if this is not done well the rest of the process is going to struggle if this is done well the rest of the process just follows as a matter of course uh, and I, I, I'd, I'd I'd like to make a statement that through the whole discovery process and up to the discovery process, including Engage, I don't like the thought we ever discuss our product or service or even our company to that much. It's all about the client yeah. and discovery is all about the client. In fact, I have a friend who says uh, he's had, he had a client that says, you know, when, when they ask, can we come in and do a discovery? Uh, the client said, um, you can come in and do my discovery, but not yours. <laughs> concept is you're helping the client discover and when i say discover and disrupt if you're in early enough you can help the client creatively think or once they you understand the challenges and issues which is the first part of discovery then you help the client creatively think through go through a thinking journey to a new way of thinking uh, and that's creating enormous value for the client. If you have the skills and capabilities to do that, and in this day and age, if you and your organisation, the salespeople, don't have that capability, you're going to be left behind. It's really vital that you can help very early in the buying journey, help the client start thinking through you know, and analysing his problems, getting the, getting the root cause, and then helping them think through how they might be able to solve those issues. Uh, in a creative and disruptive way. Now, I don't mean disruptive in a negative term. It's disruptive in a very positive way. Hmm. It's interesting. There's research, a lot of research being done with CEOs around the world by uh, uh, KPMG and various others that I've been studying. And 76% uh, of CEOs want their thinking disrupted. Yeah. They want it. They need it. They understand for the survival of their company, they've got to be disrupted in their thinking. If we as salespeople are not helping them, helping their thinking be disrupted, we're not creating value for them. Hmm. And, and as a CEO myself, uh, you know, I don't have all of the answers. Um, and um, Who you does? Know, nobody does. Uh, and for people to say, so what about this? Or what about this? Or how are you going to do this? Um, that's important because it, that's 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 learning and that's part of the discovery. Um, and I know that the way that people tend to run discovery is it, it's all about the product, and 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 the, the 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 supplier's goal is basically a demonstration, and they do a discovery to run to basically do a demonstration, and that's wrong. I I, I try and categorize selling in in, th in three different categories. There is the what would be, be you know, people say traditionally people used to sell product. It used to be a product sale, feature, function, benefit. I've got to say, right back 40 years ago when I was first taught how to sell by IBM, it was not that at all. Yeah. You know, we would go in and help understand the customer's issues and help the customer think through how they might be able to address that. And lo and behold, yes, there'll be some product that we can help them in delivering the outcome, but it was, it was not about the product. It was classic... Um, can I sell, tell a story yeah. that will, will validate this? And this is, it's a, it's a story like about story, a story. Made. Sorry? We like stories. <laughs> uh, back in, uh, in 1984, I think it was, um, and everybody will say, oh, this is an ancient story, but it's very relevant even now. Uh, I was selling manufacturing solutions to manufacturing companies, right? Closed loop manufacturing software. It was before the just-in-time manufacturing, but it was getting there in that sort of area. 
Uh, and the reality, I was, I was working for NCR at the time, and the reality, we had developed manufacturing software. Why? The world was different back in those, so we could sell hardware because the margin was in the hardware, mm -hmm. not the software. Mm -hmm. And the world has changed a lot and even changing now because of cloud and so on and so forth. So, uh, so I, I went in, you did a, 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 an engagement process, got agreement that we should do a discovery. We didn't necessarily use these terms uh, and went through the whole process. Uh, and I used to walk the factory floors, ask them about the queues in front of every machine, uh, ask them about inventory, inventory turn, why do why you accept that level of inventory return? Would it be better if you had this level of in? All sorts of questions. Um, went through the deal process, uh, and that most of that was done with the CFO and the manufacturing director. Um, and then a, a other team of people involved. They got to the stage where we put a proposal on the table, hey, we need a demonstration of the software. I hated that. As soon as you demonstrate a software, you got away from why you were doing it all down to feature function. Well, why have you got that? that yeah. yeah. And, and it's really irrelevant, but it took the focus away. So I used to set up a couple of, back in those days, green screens with the name of the software sitting on them. And I'm ready to demonstrate if we really had to. Uh, and then I'd come in and I'd start whiteboarding closed loop manufacturing. And of course, everybody's into this discussion and they really got a feel for how they can manage their business better. And on this particular occasion, they have invited even the CEO in, and, and I met the CEO in passing, but didn't really know him well. CEO came in, um, there's about 12 or 15 going through this discussion, whiteboarding closed loop manufacturing. After an hour and a half, they were supposed to be there for an hour's demonstration, an hour and a half, the CEO said, well, this has been brilliant, but I've got to go. You know, mm -hmm. time's up. And, uh, and everybody said, oh, okay. You know, I'm really pleased with I, I came and saw this. This is what we've got to do, guys, but I've got to go. Let's go. And one little guy in the back sort of said, but I haven't seen the software yet. And the, the CEO sort of turned and said, oh, look, I, I've seen enough. I'm, I'm really happy. Let's go. They left. A week later, I was out there talking with, they'd signed the contract and so on. A week later, I was out there talking with the IT manager or whoever it was at the time. And the CEO walked past and said, G'day, John, good to meet you again, or good to see you again. Why are you here? I said, oh, we're deciding where we're going to put the computer. Back in the days, we needed air conditioned rooms, etc. We're deciding where we need to, need to put the computer. And the CEO, sort of stopped, looked at me, blank look on his face and said, does a computer come with this? <laughs> the, he had bought the outcome and he knew what they had to achieve and we would talked about how they could do it with closed loop manufacturing. It's all about the outcome. It's not about your product. So if you're discussing anything to do with your product through engagement and discovery, you're not working to the client's advantage you're not helping the client yeah i, I will say until the cows come home I, I every time i go out on a call with a sales guy and he and the customer says oh we've got this problem and they jump in and say oh let me tell you how our product will solve that problem yeah. they have just destroyed the opportunity to be a partner with that client yeah i'm now a sales guy yeah i, I totally agree john um <laughs> And Sorry, um, you've got me going here. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 John. No, and 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 discovery is so important. Um, and so there's a couple of things. Um, first and foremost is the ability to ask good questions, um, to have the maturity to ask stupid questions. You know, um, I've been in so many meetings where I've said, I've said to the um, uh, to the customer, so do you have a lot of? Um, I remember going for a meeting where. Um, in um it was in um in dubai and it was like 45 degrees and we got into we you, you rush from the the salesperson's car to the office in air conditioning and i just walked in and said why have you got all those tires out the front and the salesperson said don't don't ask that that's stupid that's a stupid question and the client said no actually this is this is really important and it was that we completely sat there and unpicked the whole of the problem we we we, we thought that, that, that what he came to us and said was he didn't have enough inventory space and we were there to discuss how to make his inventory inventory better but actually what it was was that it was the throughput 
and that he would have all the lorries. So we, there was lorries stacked up. And, and my next question was, why have you got all those lorries? And what happens? He had all the lorries turning up at the same time. Why didn't you stagger them? Oh, I never thought about that. So, so we, we unpicked within an hour and a half, we'd unpicked the whole thing just by asking stupid questions rather than basically going along the lines of what the product was. And we took, we took what was an inventory deal, which was half a million dollars, and turned it into a um, two, three million dollar deal because they needed more. all the time. Yeah. And by the way, you've turned the value proposition into probably half a million dollars value yeah. to the client. Yeah. To twenty or thirty million dollars. Yeah, yeah. Because if we'd sold him, just an, yeah, if we just sold him an inventory system, it wouldn't have solved the problem. That wasn't what the problem was. Um, but so, so it, 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 it is. It is always about understanding, and and you know it irritates me when don't ask that it's a stupid question no I'm, i want to ask that and i want to ask it because it is a stupid question because that often unpicks things the other thing that i learned at a very early age was to read a set of accounts sorry read a set of financial accounts oh yes absolutely yeah absolutely um, the, and all, all your research is absolutely necessary you know the accounts uh, understanding the customer's customer go and talk to their customer customer mm -hmm. uh, that that's probably the biggest bonus i've ever had in, in making sure i spent a lot of time talking to their two or three of their top customers about the value they bring to the table and uh, where they struggle uh, where they could do better and so on before i ever go and do a discovery the uh, yeah so i, I absolutely agree um the other thing that i found out was when i was working on a deal at um, glaxo smith klein um gsk a uh, big life science organization and i couldn't understand they 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 um they kept getting this information and it was not information that you could get off the internet um, so i just asked them i said how did you find that out and i said oh there's a person at astrazeneca um which was a competitor um and uh, and oh, and they used to work here so we found them up so so actually what we found was that we had two sales on astrazeneca wasn't my account um but gsk was but we we were in effect selling to somebody not inside the account because that information was coming across um and and they were making decisions based on what steve in astrazeneca opinion was exactly complex sale yeah. It's it's incredible what you'll learn and, and discovery and disrupt that process that I, I talked about is a process in its own right. Uh, it's not as simple as asking questions. And yes, you've got to be very good at asking questions so on. But we, we really encourage people to learn and understand what the right process is. And, and in simple terms, the, the sort of thing you were just talking about is getting down and dirty in the in the trenches with them yeah. and learning, getting you know, learning where all the dirt is really understanding the guts of the problems and issues and, and so on uh, before you ever start taking them on a thinking journey to what it, you know, uh, what it might look like if they were to change. Yeah, go on, um, the go, on go on, go around the factory, um, you know, um, talk to people. Ask all the stupid questions. Yeah, yeah. No go to the and sit down, but sit down with them and go, you know, we, we, we're currently doing some work. And what, what do you think, guys? And they'll go, yeah, but you know, this is different. Oh, well, I didn't know about that. And how does that affect you? Oh, and, uh, you know, ask and just ask questions and, and listen. Why do you do it that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great, yeah. You, you thought about other ways of doing it. Huh. Well, we've always done it that way. Okay. Huh. Well, maybe later on we might discuss other ways of doing it. Would you be interested? Yeah, okay. But let's keep going down and dirty, be in the hole before we go up the hill. Yeah. Uh, the next one, V, value. V, value. No customer will make a decision unless they get a, a they can see a, a really good return on investment. It's going to change their business. You, you need to bring them to the value. Um, and at this stage, you're still not talking about, about your own product. And a lot of people talk, you know, I went in and I, I laid my value proposition on the table, right? and open it up for them so they could understand the value. Well, the fact is no value proposition I have, particularly if I had never spoken to the client, will be will hit the mark, right? And the important thing is it's the customer's value and they must formulate it in their own head. Now, we're going to help them formulate it by asking the right questions and leading them on a thinking journey and saying what would that mean and so on, but they need to come up with that value perception in their own brain 
before we can ever express it back at them. Uh, I have a friend, Dean Kelly, um, that talks about sales being a poker game. Uh, and he says it's it's absolutely vital you get the customer to put the chips on the table before you ever put it, the chips on the table. And he's talking about value. You know, never race in and say, here's a product and here's the value I can deliver you and your business, Mr. Customer. You've got to have the customer express the value and it's not about your product, it's about how they might change their business to drive the value. Your product may assist them in driving that change, but we're not to that point of discussion yet. The value proposition is the proposition by the customer on the value of a change in their business. It's not our proposition, value proposition of the value of our product for the customer. Get that out of your mind. I've, I've lived through a number of recessions and each of those recessions has re re required us to build a business case. You have to have a business case, which is based on the client's business, not what, you know, um, you may say, oh, yeah, we've got um, this garage down the road and they got this. It, the, the client won't listen to it. It has to be based on their business. Yeah, but don't forget the intangibles as well, because they yeah. can obviously often drive a decision as well. I want to get home and see my kids occasionally, right, or yeah. whatever it is. yeah. Uh, the value pro the value stage of the proposal is when you start introducing your, your, the solution you're going to bring to the table, the, the way in which you're going to help them achieve the new thinking journey they went through, the outcome that they're looking for, uh, that, that you, you built the picture for, and, and your product or service or both may assist them in getting there. Now, remember, very seldom is... Uh, your product or service on its own, the solution. There's a whole host of other things that are going to have to come together. You're 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 just one of the enablers. Mm -hmm. And if you start thinking about you being just one of the enablers, then you get on on the side of the client, and you understand everything that needs to come together, and you're just one of the partners. Okay, so um, we've had E, D, and V. Um, a. A. Well, let me just mention, before we get to A, we have put a proposal on the table during the, the V, the value. So at the end of the value, you have put a proposal on the table. So now they've suddenly, uh, they've got the vision, they, they've got how you're going to help them achieve that vision uh, and what the value proposition is, the, the return on investment and so on. So now the A is authenticate. You, you need to make sure everything you've talked about is, is authentic. Uh, and that they can see the authenticity in it. How are you going to do that? Because they won't make a decision until they 100% trust that you're going to help them achieve that vision, that change. Uh, so there's a whole host of things you can do in, th in th authentic authentic authentication. Sorry, um, uh, and you need to think about how you do that. And it can be anything from, you know, other, uh, who are your other clients that they should meet. Uh, and, and should you take them on site visits? Uh, should should you demonstrate a product or a service? Uh, but you need to think very strategically about how you authenticate. So many deals just don't go past this point. The value proposition is great. There may be even a compelling event, but it doesn't quite get over the hill and become an order because something's blocking it, and it tends to be in this authentication area so, so john you just mentioned a term a compelling event it's yep. really important can you describe that to me well there's, there's two words in compelling event one's the word compelling something is very compelling making me want to do something uh and the other's event which has what events related to a date right so um, a lot of people said, oh, yeah, I've got a great value proposition here and the P&L comes out, you know, they, they're going to get 20 times return on what they invest with us. Uh, and they, of course they're going to go ahead. Um, but if you can't put a, an event, it could be as simple as a board meeting or it could be as simple as a shareholders meeting or it could be as simple as, you know, a, a competitor's going to release a new product or you've got to find what that event is and have a date on it and have everybody working to that date and that to me is a compelling event does that make sense it does yeah yeah i, I wanted you to describe it yeah 
Um, because I, I think sometimes people think a compelling event will be, I mean, we, we, we're told to create a compelling event. So the compelling event will be our end of quarter, which, a, which is a, a compelling event to us, but not the clients. One of the big dangers in selling is that a lot of organisations do try and manipulate the event side of the, the and, and you know, we're going to have a price increase at the end of the quarter, or you know, here's a discount, we're only going to put, have it on the table. They're, they destroy trust. Mm. Uh, I'm a great believer in, in total authenticity and nothing that manipulates the client, right, because you'll destroy trust and, and that, that's the end of your relationship. So, um, no, uh, you've, you've got to look for a, an event that's relevant to the client. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it, it, it could be that, you know, it's, it's something to do with you, but it's open and honest and, uh, and, and totally transparent. You know, if, if we don't have this team we've got lined up to support you and a commitment of that team, we're going to have to release them to somebody else. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, please, let's make sure we're making this time frame. That could be valid, but you've got to be very careful that and never use it if it's not true. Hmm. It's got to be authentic. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, next is, is the letter N. Negotiate. I, I mentioned earlier, if, if we do a good discovery, the rest of these steps just happen easily. Hmm. Uh, and I, I don't know any big deal where there's not some level of negotiation. And by negotiation, I'm not talking about price negotiation or anything like that. I'm talking about there's always give and take. There's always never compromise. Um, you know, negotiation has got to be a win-win for both parties. And as soon as you start compromising, you start looking about talking about losing. So, you know, this old adage, well, you know, you put a proposal in for a million dollars and you know, we only want to spend 900000 Well, let's cut the difference and go to 950 Right. Nothing credible about that. No. You, um, in fact, you lose any level of trust. Why didn't you bid 950 in the first place? So I'm a great believer that you never discount. You might reduce your proposed price, but, but by reconfiguring what you're going to deliver. So, Mr. Customer, we can reduce from a million to 950,000 by taking this component out of our bid. And if the component's worth, it should have been in there in the first place, the customer will immediately say, whoa, no, I can understand the value of that component. Okay, well, we can look through and see if anything else we can take out. You don't discount, you, you restructure deals and so on and so forth. Never compromise. Yeah. Uh, and so and in whenever, negotiation you, that. whenever you discount, you're setting a, a precedent within the, the, the organisation. So, you know, if you say... Uh, we're going to give a 60% discount, you're giving a 60% discount on everything you sell forever. Yeah. Um, because... and this is a major issue. I've, I'm, I've been brought into organisations where discounting becomes part of the culture and yeah. and all their customers are, are trained to know that we'll discount. And oh, It's a mess. It's a mess. And it's very hard to get out of that culture once the culture is established. Yeah, we, um, um, my previous company, their their end of year was the end of May. And we basically trained all of our clients to basically not buy anything until the 25th of May um, because they just knew that they would get the, the biggest discount. Um, exactly. and, and trying to get away from that and actually try and get people to buy in Q1 or Q2 or Q3, it was so difficult. I, 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 having worked for American companies most of my life, I understand the criticality for you know, the share the, the share price and everything else to make sure we hit numbers and we, we achieve numbers each quarter and so on. However, we really have to think seriously about what it's done to our business in the longer term and particularly you know, the culture within our business, the relationship we've got with clients and so on. And, and you need to avoid that quarterly. Uh, you know, we'll and the reason the why people have a discount, John, is because the pipeline shit. Yeah. Uh, and and if people were prospecting, you wouldn't need to discount. It's a it's a it's a symptom of a of a bigger problem. Yeah, there's another subject altogether, which it I, is. Uh, yes, you and I can have to spend another hour or two on. I'm sure. Yeah, but so 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 negotiate, and then we've got um, um, commit and act. Commit and enact. It's it's an e enact. Yes. 
Um, so, um, and commit is the old close. I hate the word close. And close you should have a big deal. The, like, you don't close yeah. for me. I, you don't close big deals. It just, yeah, yeah, it just yeah. the, the 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 point at which you decide and the customer decides to you decide together. It's a commitment to each other. It's mm. not us as a sales organisation closing the customer. Uh, and you know. I've seen so many manipulative closing techniques around that that just destroy relationship, destroy trust, lose deals, might win some deals, but then lose the relationship later on and so on. Never get into that. So a commitment is exactly that. And, and if everything else has been done to this point, uh, following the, the guidelines we're looking at, following the buying journey and the, the sales process that we're talking about, uh, the, the commitment is a very sim simple process. When we're taking uh, organisations through this and driving a change program in organisations, they say, where's, your, where's your, all your training on doing a close? Uh, and we pull out one page or two pages in, the, in all the training programs and that's it. You know, how do you go, how do you go about getting a commitment? It's a little bit more than that, but essentially, it's a very very simple step of the process. Uh, and I still get a lot of companies ringing up saying, "Oh, we we we've got a good pipeline. Uh, our biggest problem is our guys don't know how to close. Could you come in and teach them how to close?" And I said, "Let me come in and have a look at your pipeline." And the issue is they haven't done the discovery process and the value value uh, creation process in the mind of the client at all effectively they've gone in with a product sell and now they're trying to close and they're close yeah i'm, I'm someone just someone um, said to me closing is a bit like a door in the cell you basically have to build a frame um and and you close and and so it shouldn't just naturally go but if you're well, not doing touch of a finger <laughs> yeah if you're not if you if you don't have if you haven't done the discovery if you don't have a proposal, if you don't have any value, as in that there's not a business case, if you're not, I don't have the, the the authenticity. There's nothing to close. That's right. That's right. And then 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 uh, you'll get all the pressures coming at the end of a month or end of the quarter by the boss saying, "Get out and close this. Come on, you said you'd you get the deal by now." Mm -hmm. So they do. They go out and try and close it and use techniques and discount and all sorts of stuff. And, all they're doing is setting the the, the the destroying relationships. Setting the whole bid on fire, you know. Mm. So, so in terms of um, so the final E, what what do you so so when we close? For me, it's always been your your what you're doing is that your there's a there's a natural process that it's not like you close and you walk away the PO and nothing happens. In a way, you're closing and and then the implementation starts or whatever but that's it kind of is part of the sale you're still part of it is that what it's you're all, saying why why we have that last letter there is exactly that tim it, it is part of the sale this process continues now you may have an implementation process to follow but in act covers all of that uh, and and it's not hey we've we've got a sale we've we've we've, we've slaughtered the bear and we're going to throw it over the fence right, it's it's the whole company thinking about the transition now and uh, now we have a uh, particularly if it's a new business we now have a client uh and and how are we going to take it forward and make sure this client grows and grows and grows and we deliver more and more value to the client right that's really really important too often we see hey we've, we've got the order uh we've got the hunter sales guy we're going to now move him on to the next bit of new business and he disappears out of the client and guess what that that salesperson has built enormous trust with the client and you just pull the rug from straight under them and say not going to have that sales guy anymore yeah you know, that's just and, one and I, I mean i'm a, I'm a new business salesperson i'm not very good at managing accounts but i mean you know give me 12 months in the, in the account because it's about there are relationships you understand the business um and at least give me a chance to basically there should be a handover but you know, one of the things that you should be doing is also, um, you know, there's a there's a term now in in the IT industry about land and expand. You know, this is about building additional relationships um, within within that organisation and using. We, we had in my previous company there were seven. There were, had a sales team of sixty six. There were seven people that always did two hundred percent. 
Yep. And and and, and I, I did some research to find out what what was it, and there was a number of things. One of the things was that in each of their accounts, they they were connected to at least two hundred people on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they were engaging with those 200 in some way or another yes yes and yeah. and, uh, and 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 quite often what would happen is that um they would just get phone calls from you know we're doing this project um and we're not quite sure what to buy but we've heard about this other project that's going on there and we thought maybe it would be a fit can you come and talk to us hmm. um and um uh, and, and 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 then you know some they would do discovery sometimes it was a case of it's 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 not really what we do or sometimes it'd be yeah, yeah it would be ideal but we never thought about this um yeah. but, but all of those seven people always knew to at least 200 people and the the people that weren't making a number would know one two maybe three people tim, tim you and i may have a, a bit of a difference here um you mentioned you're a new new sales guy, and once you've got it, yeah, you want to. You're really looking to move on to the next new sale deal. Uh, it's just my personal. Um... Yeah, I'm the same. But I've got to say, to a large extent, the world's changed, and it's changing still. Um, yeah, if you if you take, yeah, particularly in technology, most of the sales these days are something as a service, software as a service, yes. or or whatever. Uh, and therefore, when I close that that big new business, uh, all I've done is got the toe in the water. Yeah. And there's a lot more selling to be done and creating a value in that in that client's thing. I, I, I have grown to dislike the hunter farmer model because I think if you if you're targeting the right clients and you've just opened the door to a client and start and got the first order in there, now the opportunity is there to grow it and grow it and grow it and a hunter can really again i don't like the term but somebody that knows how to drive relationships and value in a client's environment and follow the sort of process we're talking about can drive more and more business depends what you're selling and, and what it is but but for most organizations particularly in the technology environment there's lots of other things you can sell into organizations or grow what you've already already uh, got a toehold on in the as a service business so i'm a little bit concerned about you know i'm a new business sales guy versus i'm an account manager model john it's it's been insightful thank you very much um, we've done 42 minutes, so uh, it, it does go very quickly. Remind, oh. people, remind people where they can get hold of you. Uh, just John Smybert, S-M-I-B-E-R-T. Um, by the way, I, I um, publish a video every week for sales and sales leaders uh, on my YouTube ch channel. Again, look up John Smybert or um, Sales Leader Forums, uh, and you'll find that. Yeah, I'm, I, as you see, I'm passionate about this. The issue, and let, let's finish with this. The issue I see is back in our day, and, and you're not as old as I am, but back in our day, um, the, the companies used to develop their sales teams uh, and invest a lot in that development. The world's changed, and that level of loyalty between company and employer doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. So companies aren't willing to put that investment in anywhere near what they used to. And therefore, their overall level of capability of salespeople and sales management, and that's, mm -hmm. as Tony Hughes says, where the, where the link, weak link in the revenue chain is in sales management. Yep. The, the, the development is not happening as, as effectively. So my passion is just to help organisations develop that capability, get the right sales culture in place. And so I'm producing lots of content and I'm about to write a book on the subject we've just been through and so on. I'm not finished writing the book, I'll publish it next year. So you've got me on one of my top subjects and I really love the discussion, Tim. Good, John, John it's been fantastic. And by the way, I, I, you know, John creates an awful lot of content. Um, so I met just I'm John and I met in um, Sydney when I was in Australia um, and um, we rattled off um, seven five minute videos. We then found out one of the cameras wasn't, wasn't working. And then so he had to come back and we rattled off another um, seven five minute videos. But he's doing this with loads of people and there's so much insight. And it's part of it is about creating a debate in sales, you know, sales as a as a. Um, as a professional organization has to move forward and develop 
um, and it and, and it's best doing that by debating. And, it, and John gets all kinds of people to, to to interview. So I would certainly recommend that you follow John and and uh, um, and, and join in the discussion. Thank you, Tim. It's been a real pleasure. You're welcome, and and have a great day. I know it's the end of end of the day for you and the beginning of the day for me. So, uh, but Good John, day, mate. Look forward it's to been the fantastic. Next time. Great. <laughs> Thanks, John. Bye. Take care. Bye.